Hello, welcome to Sendai, a city on the east coast of Japan, a city hit hard by the earthquake of 2011 and, of course, that devastating tsunami which followed in its wake. You know, there's no doubt anymore that the number of natural disasters and, in some cases, their severity is growing year by year. But never mind how we cope in the aftermath, how we manage rescue and recovery, what about our preparation for these disasters? How resilient are we today in dealing with a natural disaster? Well, that is precisely the challenge facing the United Nations at its third World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction. And it is a huge challenge. How do you create a strategy to make the world more resilient. Well, we brought together experts from big business, insurance and national governments to discuss that very issue. What are they doing collectively to make our world a safer place to live in? Senator Lagarde, let me start with you, if I can. I mean, you, you come from a country which, let's say, uh, is pretty familiar with natural disasters by uh, now, Only I 20 would hope. typhoons a year right. with volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and right. more natural hazards. But we have a resilient 100 million population. A very resilient population. Nonetheless, with all that experience, three years ago, you get caught from the blind side, if I can put it that way. Tacloban exactly. loses 8,000 people die. Yes. Cyclone Haiyan, a cyclone on a level you haven't seen before. That's true. It's not easy when Haiyan hits you. No matter how prepared you are, seven, 8,000 people have perished up to now. Recovery is ongoing. And so what do we do? I'm glad the business sector is here. Uh, business continuity planning. The way to do it is let us allow or we must mandate that disaster risk reduction should not just be everybody's business. Its resilience should be in our DNA. Jerry Brownlee, um, difficult to build in the resilience beforehand, but what sort of lessons do you feel you have picked up from Christchurch and taken forward, particularly in terms of buildings regulations, um, tougher structures, better infrastructure. Can you give us an example of, of the ways in which things have changed in Christchurch? Well, it was a, on a scale of actual uh, damage smaller than Sendai or the Philippines. Uh, for us, it was very big. We're only a population of four and a half million people. Uh, so we had what we thought were strong building codes, and they saved people's lives. Uh, but nonetheless, a thousand buildings in our CBD had to be demolished uh, because they were no longer structurally sound. Uh, so we've learnt that we have to not only prepare for uh, an event like this where uh, resilience is about saving people's lives, but now perhaps look also at preserving economic value as well. Aris, I imagine that will be music to your ears because I know you don't believe that across the piece building codes essentially are strong enough. Does it take a disaster, do you think, to strengthen building codes? And, and is it fair to say across the board they're not strong enough? Unfortunately, David, you're right. Uh, it's almost like uh, health. You know, it takes a heart attack for some people to realize that they need to live a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and the problem we have is that we're waiting for the heart attacks to happen to, to do the right things often. I hope it's not nearby. <laughs> no, but please, <laughs> we don't know. Um, Secretary General ye yesterday mentioned a, an important figure. He said that the the economic cost of disasters has reached $300 billion on average a year. Well, that's more than the GDP of 80% of the world's countries. So maybe we're saving lives. There are, you know, escape uh, approaches, but then people don't have their homes to go back to, their communities, and so forth. And there's an 80-20 paradox there in that even at this conference, we spend probably 80% of our time talking about infrastructure and large public. And yet 80% of the built environment is actually the smaller homes, residential, and uh, like commercial. 
And when it comes to resilience, the bar may be here for infrastructure and large commercial, but the bar is way down here today for residential and small, small commercial. And, and that's what people's livelihoods, that's where most of people's savings is in their homes and their communities, and we're losing that battle. That's very interesting. Jerry Brownlee, you were saying mm -hmm. a lot of homes suffered, <clears throat> but they weren't destroyed. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you would counter mm -hmm. that argument a little. So our codes are definitely rising, uh, improving. Our, our methods of uh, uh, foundation construction changing uh, and uh, for the better. What I think is uh, interesting though is that we, we've had uh, timber frame construction in New Zealand uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, virtually since uh, uh, post-European occupation of the country. And uh, so that technology also has moved quite considerably in the last 50 years particularly, uh, and now has taken another step. So if I look at new homes being uh, built post-earthquake, uh, greater consideration of various seed factors in it, uh, a whole lot better bracing, uh, and uh, also then on those foundations that are going to allow the land uh, to move uh, as, as it will in future events, uh, without disturbing the, uh, the, the state of the building. Whether you're in New Zealand or in the Philippines, in whatever um, area of the world, risk assessment must be done um, by developers and housing, etc., before you build a home. Will I build my home or a school building or a classroom in a geohazard area? Is this a vulnerable area that is pro prone to a storm surge or to a landslide or to soil erosion? And therefore, an environmental impact assessment should include risk assessment and perhaps a geohazard map in every city, municipality, which we're doing in the Philippines, which I'm certain is done in many other areas of the world, should be institutionalized. The guys who know the most about risk and the best analysis, uh, people to analyze what risk are, in my opinion, are in the private sector and do lie with the, uh, the insurers. Well, you point straight to Martin Parker, mm -hmm. and I, I wonder whether um, Senator Lauren's view is that that should be mandatory, you should have that sort of level of, of risk assessment made. But we, we live in this mm. ever-increasingly urbanised world, everyone's got to find a place. Yes. Every last inch is being used up. Can you do that? I think it's, uh, it's very hard to make it mandatory for all sorts of political and social reasons, but it's, um, it's got to be best practice, it's got to become something that uh, in the future we spend a lot more time on. So what the insurance industry do, alongside the, the, the work that you do actually, is help to put a price tag on that risk. So if you choose to be in this location, what would be the cost of insurance, which gives you an idea of the, the level of risk that is associated. So in Japan, for instance, they've had building codes since 1981, bought around for the first time because of the experience post-earthquakes of losses. Those building codes have been enhanced over the years as more knowledge and science and engineering has come to the fore and further earthquake events have happened. So when it comes to pricing those risks, the insurance industry is quite granular in terms of looking at that data and um, figuring out the generations of the buildings and the risks. Just before you come in, Elon, yes. I want to bring in Mr. Shiga as yes. well, because obviously <laughs> Nissan, Nissan was one of those companies which came out with a gold star, frankly, to its name. I, I, this is not meant to be an opportunity to sing your praises particularly, but it's true, your recovery was very fast. What was it, do you think, that enabled you to deal with this better than others? Luck? or was there a strategy behind it? The reason why Nissan could, uh, you know, that the recovery uh, relatively quickly as a, a Japanese company, there are two reasons, this is my summary. Why is uh, we conducted a lot of the disaster during, before the, you know, the disasters. And uh, also, this is uh, very luckily, we conducted uh, uh, simulation during, just two weeks before, the earthquake. So it just happened that yes. two weeks before yeah. the tsunami and, uh, and the earthquake yes. struck, you carried out a full crisis scenario. Yeah, they are really fortunately, uh, unfortunately, you know, that uh, the assumption of the disaster simulation itself is uh, completely almost the same. So that we quickly, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, uh, implemented for the countermeasures. This is one of the reasons. Another reason is, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the Gemba people, operational people, is, this is one of the uh, Japanese strengths, you know, the work together and uh, make every effort to restore the brand and so on, including the supplier. I want to move this on a little bit now to the, the question of private and 
public sectors working together or not working terribly well together. Uh, Jerry Brownlee, let me ask you, in terms of some of the developments, some of the new developments that you're bringing in to Christchurch to make the infrastructure more durable, more flexible, um, more resilient, you might be able to give me an example or two, I don't know, but, but can you also give me an idea as to who is driving the innovation there? Is that coming courtesy of government or in conjunction with private? Because it's usually private sector who come up with the innovative ideas. It's a, a strong mix of both. Uh, so uh, just picking up on a comment before, we've had since 1945 uh, an insurance scheme run by the government uh, known as the Earthquake Commission uh, that uh, provides first loss insurance on residential properties and building platforms. Uh, now that takes the first loss, it's the insurance industry that picks up the balance of that and so we've got a, we, we were very lucky to have uh, an in excess of 95% penetration of insurance cover on uh, residential areas. It's worked very well for us. Um, when it comes so to... That, a, that means you're not paying as government. Yeah. Is that right? There's no payout from oh, the government? Yeah, so the, the cost of our disaster um, is measured at about $46 billion uh, US uh, and uh, the, the government will end up paying for about 20% of that. 80% of it is going to come from uh, the private insurance market. So it, extrapolating that out of it, uh, we had very significant damage to uh, underground infrastructure which no one sees, your sewer, your wastewater, your fresh water. Uh, and the way in which to, uh, we, we've chosen to go about fixing that is to put together an alliance structure between the five biggest civil constru uh, construction companies in New Zealand uh, and get them into the field alongside local government uh, 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 people who've got a knowledge of that infrastructure uh, and just go ahead and repair it. And the government sits in a governance arrangement above that, uh, simply providing the funding alongside uh, uh, local government. And that, that might seem somewhat risky, uh, but it, it has had the effect of uh, those people who have that massive expertise uh, being able to put together a program that can move quickly. Well, I, I think both uh, New Zealand and, and uh, Japan are kind of at the top of the, the peak here. I also had a chance to visit the Philippines uh, before coming to, to Japan and, and really can appreciate the challenge they have there in addressing both resilience and also uh, the social standards, moving the social standards at the same time up. The, the discussion between private and public sectors is often uh, times an issue of, of getting on the same frequency, getting to the same language, because sometimes we don't speak the same language. And um, I'll, I'll give you some, you know, some simple examples, one coming from this conference itself. Uh, one of the major, uh, so let's say, slogans here is build back better, okay? Uh, to us, that's not satisfying. Uh, it should be build better from the start. So, you know, waiting for disaster to happen to build back better just won't get us there uh, in the end. Well, you're, you're splitting hairs at the moment, though, aren't you? G given where we are in yeah. this process, which right. is not very far mm -hmm. advanced, you settle for build back better. But we're building a lot of things from scratch. We're investing a lot of money uh, today, billions and billions of dollars every day, building new things. Why not build them better from the, from the start instead of facing them years down the road uh, in terms of disasters? The, the other uh, point of, of communication is on this whole issue of affordability. Whenever we talk about building codes, about regulations, about standards, we always get into the discussion, well, we can't afford it. What is affordable? What is not affordable? And, and the dilemma is this, in that you can make anything unaffordable, uh, or you can make anything affordable by lowering the standards. You can have affordable food with low standards, affordable health, but that's not what we want. And affordable, at the end, is not the most economic. When you add the cost of disasters, the cost of maintenance, the social cost, it is probably the most expensive option. So really the question needs to be phrased in how do we make resilience more affordable, not how we make you know, the built environment more, more affordable by lowering the standards. How can we work together between public and private to make the construction more affordable, to make materials more affordable, more available, and, and so on and so forth. If we can bring that dialogue to that frequency, I think we can get somewhere. Yes, I think uh, there is no disconnect between the private and the public sector because clearly, and if I may disagree with the gentleman beside me from Swiss Re, indeed risk assessment can be mandated. I do not, I think it's being defeatist for us to say that we just have to focus on the best practices and we cannot mandate it. That's what governments are there for, that's what policymakers are there for. There is no 
wait to turn back, we must mandate that risk assessment uh, be mandated in uh, local government, in private infrastructure. Uh, building codes must be improved and uh, vulnerability assessments uh, and its impact on health, on the structures, um, integrity must all be inputted. And all of that information can come from what the gentleman from New Zealand has mentioned, from science and the private sector. Martin, the question of uh, policymakers have their role to play, but insurance companies surely could do so much more, couldn't they, to incentivise more resilient homes and, and buildings? Well, in fact, yeah, I think uh, we already mentioned that putting a price tag on risk, so a differential price is, is one reason for in incentivising those resilient buildings. I think if you step back a little bit, and uh, I welcome the Senator's challenge that it should be mandated, and I guess this Philippines debate, can right? lead. But in some countries, I think, Harris, in the United States, for example, the government ends up taking that risk, doesn't it, on some areas of insurance? The huge residential market. It's a huge risk. And many insurance companies are withdrawing from it because the bar is set down so low. Uh, in the end, it's about how much a country is prepared to accept that it's going to have that risk. Now, I, I don't mean to criticise the United States, but I, I find it amazing that we're a Pacific Rim country that can have 95% plus uh, uh, of our residential properties insured, uh, yet in somewhere like California it's down below 17%. And uh, you just ask, well, why is that? What's the, what's the reason? Part of our success, I think, has been having uh, one body that is mandated to uh, offer that first loss cover. Um, it occurred because the private insurers didn't want the risk, uh, but once uh, it was taken on in the first instance uh, by this body, uh, very quickly, um, as you got better information about what that risk was, uh, everyone piled in. And uh, you know, I, I think that model is, is open to anyone, and New Zealand's very happy to share that with, uh, with anyone anywhere in the world. Aris, would, would the American model be an anomaly? Yeah, I, I'm kind of divided as to whether government should be in insurance or not be in insurance. The flood insurance program in the U.S. has been a failure. They're, they're losing $20 billion a year, obviously taxpayer money. They're not in, improving the resilience. And they're really incentivizing risk taking. So, you know, government sometimes getting insurance is a double-edged sword. They can promote the wrong yeah. side of risk. If, if they don't price it properly, if they don't yeah. advance resilience. Right. Jerry, let me just ask you, I mean, when you have a crisis, and you've, you've obviously been working through a crisis with Christchurch, <laughs> after a while that crisis has become a, a drama for those people who aren't sorted out, but it's not a crisis anymore, and the drive for change can dip. What's the experience in Christchurch? Well, no dip just yet. I think there's uh, an expectation that uh, with all due respect to those who might be worried about it, that we will build back better. That it, uh, uh, what we're going to end up with is a, with a city that is uh, uh, vastly improved on what it was before, but also much more aware of what its risks are uh, than it was before. People are much more appreciative of uh, some of those extra costs that are going to go into new builds uh, that will protect them in the future. So I, I take your point, I think. Um, uh, the other point I'd say is that if you go back a couple of decades, the ability for people to actually understand all this, to get the information quickly and to assimilate it, didn't exist as it does now. Martin, quickly. <laughs> David, thank you. Yeah, I, I just think the, um, the, the, the history and the lessons in Japan have been handed down through the generations, and I think this is going to happen now in New Zealand. So where it has happened, uh, we as a society need either sometimes for regulation, but sometimes for just customs and information flows, education, help the society understand what they need to do. I think the scenarios where we have the, the barrier so low, um, people can convince themselves that kind of thing and never happened to me. Well, it never happened to me probably won't be the mindset in New Zealand and isn't in Japan. Um, and if it's it never happened to me, then maybe we need to put regulation in to, to change that. Uh, I don't think the human beings will change it of their own volition. There needs to be a culture shift. It hasn't started really yet. I mean, in our daily lives, we upgrade ourselves in many things that we pr procure. We don't buy the, the least expensive food item. We don't get the least expensive health care. We don't get the least expensive education. And yet, in the most important part of our lives, which is our home, we seem to indirectly accept the bottom that the system, let's say, has set for us. And that bottom is below the, the hazard level. We don't realize that it is below the hazard level, but it is, in many countries, below the hazard level. So I think the awareness, the education, to, to tell people there is a choice. You have a choice. You can go above that minimum. You're doing it in every other part of your life. You don't have the, the lowest uh, feature cell phone, for example, or, or smartphone, 
uh, why not upgrade yourself on resilience? Uh, so that, that is an attitude that has to be cultivated, and we need probably to learn from the auto industry, which went through a similar phase in the 60s, 50 years ago. And today, they market their pro they try to art market each other based on the safety features of their product. We don't do that in the building industry, unfortunately, yet. Well, I think it's clearly there's a, a, mm -hmm. a responsibility on larger companies, mm -hmm. as there is on governments, on a mm -hmm. na national, local, international scale as well. That is the point at which we're going to have to close for now. So I would just like to say uh, to you all from uh, on behalf of uh, the panel here, thank you very much indeed for being with us and taking part. Uh, and if I could also say thank you to Toshiyuka Shiga, to Martin Parker, to Senator Lagarda, to Aris Papadopoulos, and to uh, Jerry Brownlee. Thank you very much indeed for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.